It's good to see you. Welcome. Glad to have you. Um, it's been a while. It's good to see people with their faces, actually, for a change. Um, uh, we haven't seen you for a while, but we've been busy in the meantime. Uh, the college, being the campus here, hasn't really shut down quite at all. First, we operate as an essential business, uh, then as a religious institution, and then there was an exemption for libraries as well. So we found a way uh, at every moment. We kept the classes going, and we kept uh, our programs going. We're very happy to welcome all of you back. I know this, I think this is our second lecture, but we're off to the races. Um, so welcome. Good to have you here. Uh, the graduate school uh, that we launched a bit ago is uh, on, going on two years now. Is we kept that going as well, and it's off to a great start. We've got a great round of, of, of students. We have some ex uh, renovations planned for the, this building. You can see in the Washington parlor afterwards. We can, if you want to take a look at those. Uh, so we are keeping, keeping going apace uh, and busy as always. Uh, this week, we actually put something else new out, which I wanted to mention before uh, we get to our speaker. Uh, for those of you who know, uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, I was briefly on leave as the executive director of the 1776 Commission. Um, I was fired, so <laughs> it, was, it was a pretty good gig while it lasted, but I kept my day job and I'm back. Uh, but Hillsdale College took up that mantle. Uh, among other things, the commission has kept meeting. We met here, actually, despite having been abolished. Uh, but the college took on its part of that work uh, because the commission asked and called on the creation of accurate and good, honest historical curriculum. Uh, this week, actually just a few days ago, Hillsdale College has released to the public, free of charge to anybody who wants to use it, a parent, a school, a homeschooler, a school district, a, a full curriculum covering civics and all of American history having to do with the founding and the Civil War era. Uh, and that's free for anybody's use. So. We, we know what we're against. We think it's important to also know what we're for. Uh, this evening, we are privileged to have with us um, uh, and we were talking earlier, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk, uh, the former acting, uh, the Commissioner of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection in the Trump Administration. Uh, he's currently a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he, he has a B.S. in engineering from Central Missouri State University and a J.D. from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He also served as um, the Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol in the Obama Administration and the Director of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, he is a former active member of and a reserve to the United States Marine Corps. And he served over 20 years. He's got a very impressive and amazing career, over 20 years in the FBI in a various variety of positions. Uh, he was an Assistant Section Chief for the National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime Branch. Uh, he was deputy on the scene commander in Baghdad, Iraq, a special agent in charge of the El Paso Division, and assistant director in charge of the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, just down the highway. Uh, it's a very impressive career, and thank you for that service to your country. Uh, this evening, he, he is speaking on the crisis at our southern border. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mark Morgan. First of all, thanks. Um, most of the time I don't need a mic, I'm pretty loud. Put that up a little bit. Um, so first of all, thanks for um, allowing me to come here and give me a few minutes to talk about uh, the crisis at the southern border. Um, first of all, I think that um, engagements like this are very, very important uh, because the message is not getting out there. The truth and the reality and the transparent it simply doesn't exist. And when Matt, when, when, when Matt first reached out, and by the way, Matt, is, if I go a little long, just give me the five-minute hook, okay? Because at the end, I, I really do want to hear from you, too. I, I want to hear your questions. It really helps me kind of shape going forward what you think is important. And quite frankly, the misinformation that continues to go out there, it's important for me to know. Um, but when Matt first reached out, he referred to it as the crisis at the southern border. And uh, I, I really like that 
Because as you go, one of my main themes is going to be that it is about a crisis at the southern border. It's not just about illegal immigration. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about that as I go on. So look, first of all, I'm speaking to you today uh, because this country is in the midst of an undeniable crisis on our southwest border. Plain and simple. That's the fact. That's the reality. It's a crisis with respect to our sovereignty. It's a crisis with respect to our security and our future. In just a few short months, the Biden administration, and this is key, has intentionally and methodically um, created a man-made crisis at our southern border. They've done this by purposely undoing every single meaningful uh, security tool, authority, and policy that we had in place under the Trump administration. And let me, just a couple of facts, I think that speaks for themselves. Four straight months of 170,000 illegal aliens per month. The June numbers just came out, almost 190,000 apprehensions of illegal aliens in a single month. That is the highest, that's the third highest monthly totals in over 21 years. And once illegal aliens break into our country and her illegally and they're released under this administration, they're not deported. Why? Because they have all but gutted ICE with respect to their enforcement authorities. And I've been saying since the beginning, they're creating a welcoming center on the front end and a sanctuary country on the back end. Never in this country's history has our national security been harmed and targeted for the sole purpose of political gain. I'm often asked to, to talk about my perspective on border security and the undeniable illegal immigration crisis that we have on our, our southwest border. But he, here's an issue, and I started off with this, is that the, prim, the very premise of how we look at border security and illegal immigration really is, is faulty. Uh, it's generated on misguided, uninformed, and, and forces the American people into a false binary choice. In today's politically charged, uh, ideologic charged environment, um, you know, most of our collective bandwidth, it, it goes something like this. It's, it's about the plight of, of uh, immigrants looking for a better life. And so what that does is that binary choice, it forces us in the binary choice that, that if, if we don't accept the end justifies the means and the policies responsible for driving the worst Southwest border crisis we've seen in modern history is is separate and distinct from securing our border. It's just not true. Um, that the reality is when policies open our borders to blatantly incentivize, encourage, and facilitate. I used to say incentivize, encourage. In this administration, I'm actually add another adjective: facilitate illegal immigration. Our borders across the board also become increasingly less secure and more vulnerable to the ever-changing vast complex set of threats that we face from outside our borders. The threats are not mutually exclusive from each other, but the open border advocates in this administration are forcing us into this binary choice. Um, when, when we, so when we discuss illegal immigration, it's essential that we do so with an understanding of how it's synonymous with border security. And at its core, illegal immigration also serves a broader national interest. It's about the rule of law. We were just talking about that a few minutes ago. It's about protecting our national security and our public safety. It's about protecting American wages and jobs. That list can go on and on with respect to the broad national interest that it serves. And the threats that we face, here's another false narrative that's out there that they really try to force down. And this is another important element in addition to the fact that border security is not separate from illegal immigration, is that the threats that we face on our southern border, quite frankly, any of our borders, do not stay at the southwest border. They make their way into every neighborhood in our country. That's why I've been saying for a long time, every town, city, and state is actually a border town, city, and state. Um, the, um, the criminal organizations, look, they, they are sophisticated. And they exploit every single gap that's available through weak, ambiguous, and, and faulty U.S. policy. And this is important. When our policies strengthen a criminal organization's ability to facilitate one criminal activity, it strengthens their ability to facilitate every single criminal activity coming to our borders. Look, it's very clear. 
Um, it, it, as they get stronger and more powerful and their bank accounts grow because of the profits from illegal immigration, from human trafficking, I mean uh, human smuggling, their, their ability to increase and expand uh, uh, their capability with respect to human trafficking goes up. Uh, smuggling of gang members goes up. Smuggling of criminal aliens goes up. Drugs pouring into this country goes up. It's just common sense. These organizations are sophisticated. And over decade after decade, they've proven their capacity and ability to shift their what we call TTPs, tactics, tactics techniques, and procedures with the shift of American policy, laws, and regulations. And they do so effectively. Look, they don't see... Look, they, they see 20 pounds of methamphetamine just as they see 20 illegal aliens uh, that they're smuggling in the United States. It's a co commodity. And all they see is their ability to increase their profit, their leverage, their power, their influence, and their strength. And when you allow their criminal scheme, one criminal scheme to increase, you're absolutely increasing their profit, leverage, power, influence, and strength. And as U.S. right now, law enforcement agencies, are being forced to deal with this, this unmitigated crisis on our southwest border. Um, you've got, in, in multiple areas along the southwest border, you have 40 to 50 percent of the border patrol resources on the front lines of our borders. They're being pulled away to deal with the unprecedented humanitarian crisis, the unprecedented volume. Think about it. 190,000 illegal aliens in 30-day period. Think about, just from a common sense perspective, you don't have to be a border security expert. The, 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 extraordinary resources and manpower that it takes to apprehend those individuals, process them, and give them the appropriate humanitarian assistance they need. Sometimes I, I refer to it, and I'm not off, is, is daycare uh, uh, assistance as well. That's just the fact. That's the truth. I had a border, real quick, I had a border agent when I was still chief of the border patrol. I went down there and I visited a facility. It looked like a Costco. It really did. I mean, from floor to ceiling, the, the ceilings were higher than this and their shelves all the way up. Baby formula, baby diapers, clothes, you know, that were labeled from, you know, zero to two, two to four, and et cetera. And I had a border patrol agent in almost 20 years said, you know, sir, I never thought in my entire career that my major responsibility would be to procure baby formula and diapers. That's what they're being utilized for. So if you think about that, if you've got 40 to 50% of border patrol resources being pulled off the line, again, I would say common sense tells you there's large areas of the border that are wide open and not secure. And this, I keep going back to this, you don't have to see, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that correlation that I was talking about. Having over a million illegal immigrants attempt to uh, illegally in our southwest border in just a few months overwhelms our front line defenses, overwhelms our resources, pulls them off the front line, and creates the perfect storm for the cartels to exploit. Not only, not only are they profiting from the increased human smuggling uh, efforts because of the open board policies, but, but, which is, by the way, a multi-billion dollar uh, industry for them each year annually, but they're also using the very uh, uh, humans that they are exploiting and illegally entering to profit from other schemes. They actually literally will say, okay, you know what? Uh, we're gonna charge you $5,000, we'll in addition to this, here's this backpack of drugs. Put it on your back, you're going across with the drugs. Happens every single day in every single one of the nine sectors on the Southwest border. Um, they actually will use the, 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 the individuals, the migrants that, that they're trafficking and, and, and smuggling across, I call them as distraction ponds. Knowing that the border patrol resources are going to have to respond to unaccompanied minors or families, they'll actually flood an area of about 20, 50 families, knowing all the border patrol resources will go there. Again, don't have to be a rocket scientist or border security expert to know Then, right next to them physically, the border is wide open, drugs are pouring across, gangs members are pouring across, illegal aliens are, are, are pouring across. Um, so again, you, you, you facilitate one, it makes it exponentially easier and the likelihood of uh, other uh, criminal schemes happening. And one big thing, we were talking about this a minute ago, gotaways, gotaways. We don't talk about that. A gotaway is someone that, that because border patrol resources are pulled away, because our borders are not secure, they get past our, our uh, first line of defense uh, with, uh, on, on the southwest border. So right now, and I'm looking for the, the details here, so um, where am I at? So they, yeah, so um, right now it's estimated that, that here it is, fiscal year to date, the gotaways, 
270,000 gotaways this fiscal year. 270,000. They have gotten past the Border Patrol resources because they're pulled off the line providing the humanitarian assistance. And here's where um, that, that I think in today's environment, you know, politics, ideology drive the narrative rather than facts. And usually this is where the ideologues will, will jump up and call me a fear monger and call me a racist as they stick their heads deeply in the sand to avoid the truth and reality. Is of those 270,000, by the way, that, that's larger than the city of Arlington, Virginia, right? This fiscal year, 270,000. Among them are some really bad people. That's the truth. They're not all good. Now, they're not all bad, but they're not all good. There is a, con and, and, and the numbers of bad are not statistically inconsequential. They are consequential. And in that group of that 270,000 that have gotten by are criminals, rapists, child pedophiles, uh, other violent uh, 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 predators. And yeah, even people have been convicted of DUIs, which a lot of times people want to dismiss even though it's killed 10,000 American citizens annually. Um, that's the truth and that's the reality. But when was the last time you heard the mainstream media talk about the 270,000 Godaways? Have you ever heard it? Right? I was going to say, most of you probably haven't even heard that, that number. And, and, and I'll go back to what I started with, is that what happens on the border doesn't stay on the border. Right? Those 270,000, they're not staying on the southwest border towns and city. The, 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 the border is the throughput. They're making their way into every town, city, and state in this country. And let, let me give you a couple more stats. In the past, first of all, in the past decade, Border Patrol alone has, rep, has apprehended tens of thousands of criminal aliens. That's who they've apprehended, right? This year alone, they've apprehended over 8,000 criminal aliens, 8,000. And, and gang members, rapists, pedophiles. I always ask somebody, how many is enough to, to, to let in the United States? What, 100 gang members, 1,000 gang members? How, how many rapists and murders? And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. That's the truth and that's the fact. I, I'll give you another stat that backs that up. ICE alone, last year, 2020, ICE apprehended 100,000. And that was a, a low year. COVID and some other elements played a, a factor in that. They arrested 100,000. Uh, um, they made 100,000 arrests last year for people that were here in the country illegally. And remember, ICE isn't on the border. They're in the interior of the United States, everywhere in the United States, 100,000. 90% of them either had been convicted of a, crime, of, of a crime or had been charged. 90% of them. That's another false narrative that's out there that gets me fired up, is that this, you know, they've reset the, the, the ICE priorities, uh, quote, to go after a priority targets. So they already are, you know, a criminal. If you're here illegally and you're a criminal, I don't care what you're charged with, you should be a priority. Not this administration. This administration has to be a known suspected terrorist or convicted, convicted of an aggravated felony to actually be a priority for ICE to uh, actually remove you. Um, yeah, so look, and, and, and let me, I'll go here a little bit here. So, so look, they, and, and as all this is going on, again, what one, one criminal activity is connected to another. They're interconnected. It's all about border security. What happens on the southwest border doesn't stay on the southwest border. In addition to that, as the cartels are, are, are reaping their money, look, the Biden administration immediately, when they opened their borders and turned human smuggling back on, they turned a multi-billion dollar business back on for the cartels. What do you think they're going to do with that? Look, they're going to take that money to facilitate more sophisticated techniques. They're going to improve their capacity to build tunnels, to use drones, ultralights, maritime operations, it goes on and on. And that's just in between the ports of entry. At the ports of entry, I, I, I could sit for two hours to talk about the different techniques that they use to smuggle drugs through our legal points of entry. And why are they able to do that? Because they are, they are one of the most advanced, sophisticated, well-funded organizations um, right now in, in the world. And right now, it's because this administration has turned on their, their human uh, smuggling capabilities. I used to joke around a little bit, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious when I say, you know, the cartels could come to Harvard and teach a class, well, they could come to Hillsdale and, 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 and teach a class on, on business resiliency and flexibility. Uh, they, are, they are that good. And so the point being here is, look, if you have one element of our border that is out of control, 
every element of our borders out of control. You can't separate, you can't just say that our border's out of control for illegal immigration, but it's secure for everything else. It doesn't work that way. It's all interconnected. So if you're out of control with your illegal immigration, which clearly you are, it's out of control with drugs, it's out of control with human trafficking, it's out of control with gangs and criminal aliens and our national security. It's all out of control if one element's out of control. And look, Ronald Reagan, it's a quote, I love it, a nation that cannot control its borders is not a nation. I couldn't have said it better myself. So look, we, we can't be swayed um, by, by those that are being driven by what I call ideologic hubris and the quest for perpetual political power. That's what I say. The current, and look, I know we see this. I know we all do. I, I have to believe this. I want to believe this, that we all see the, the, the clear abundant hypocrisy that's happened with this administration. Look, it wasn't that long ago where this country faced the worst terrorist incident in our nation's history. We came together in a bipartisan uh, uh, way on, on multiple fronts uh, back then. And I'll give you one quick example. The 2000 Secure Fence Act. I won't ask for hands, but I'm just curious how many have actually heard about the 2006 Secure Fence Act. It was a bipartisan effort. Okay, a couple of hands, right? It, it, it actually got overwhelming support in the Senate. And here, here's, here's what the Secure Fence Act said. It mandated that DHS follow the tried and true tested. It actually codified the multi-layer strategy of technology, personnel, and infrastructure. And infrastructure is the wall, right? And, and, and it all gets better. Ironically, the Secure Fence Act actually goes into detail and says and talks about that you will build two layers of infrastructure. It will have access roads and sensors and lighting, and it goes on and on. Sound familiar? It's exactly what we were doing on the Trump administration. And in fact, the Secure Fence Act led to 650 miles of wall being built. In the Trump administration, we were just building it better. That's the truth. And let me tell you, so, so we had, because th this is important with, with, respect to the, with respect to the hypocrisy, that, that the act gained resounding support from pr prominent congressional members. Senator then Biden, Clinton, Carper, Durbin, Feinstein, Kerry, Obama, Schumer, I can keep going on. These are all individuals that voted for the 2000 Secure Fence Act that mandated that, that the DHS build a wall that resulted in two, 650 miles of wall being built from 2006 to 2011, right? So what I think this shows is a couple of things. One is traditionally, there has at least been some illusion that we've been agree, agreed, regardless of what party, that border security was important. But I think it also shows the unconscionable, undeniable hypocrisy and lies that are being told. And let me, let me give you a couple of quotes. And I, I looked this up, I could, I, I, there are volumes of quotes that I could give, but there's just a couple I wanna share with you. This is what was said. We simply cannot allow people to pour in the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked, circumventing the line of people who are waiting patiently, diligently, and lawfully to become immigrants in this country. Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Sounds like something President Trump would say, right? Guess who? Senator Barack Obama, right? I voted numerous times when I was senator to spend money to build a wall, a barrier, to try to prevent illegal immigrants from coming in. Nope, not Trump, Hillary Clinton. Illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. People who enter the United States without permission are illegal aliens, and illegal aliens should not be treated the same as people who enter the United States illegally. Now that sounds like something President Trump would say, right? Nope. Senator Chuck Schumer. Two, 2009, he gave a speech to Georgetown University three years after he voted for the Secure Fence Act that was at that very time building wall on our southwest border. And during that speech, he's bragging about the 2000 Secure Fence Act, calling the illegal aliens, illegal aliens, what they are, and, 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 and talking about how effective the wall is. I really encourage everybody, look, there's about, I think it's about 12 minutes, 2009, Georgetown University, Google it, watch it. The hypocrisy will be uh, uh, apparent. Here's the last one. Uh, yeah. I voted for a fence. I voted for 700 miles of fence. And let me tell you something, folks. People are driving across that border with tons, tons, hear me, tons of everything from methamphetamine to cocaine to heroin. It's all coming up through cor uh, corrupt Mexico. Who said that? Joe Biden, right? 
So now, 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 so, so, so statements made by, by both Republican and Democrat presidents, congressional members uh, in the past, has illustrated that, that traditionally we have all been united uh, when it comes to border security. Uh, but clearly it shows the hypocrisy. You know, President Trump, his border security uh, and immigration policies the past four years have been called hardline, right, immoral and racist, when in reality, the, the very phrases that they're labeling as racist or hardline are indistinguishable from what the Democrats have been saying, prominent Democrats have been saying. And that's why I get fired up uh, about, about the hypocrisy. And somehow, you know, look, I, I get really frustrated because somehow these, these strongly held Democratic uh, uh, beliefs um, were supposedly as American as apple pie just a few years ago have been replaced with a new version of what is moral, just, and American way. The 650 miles that were built from 2006 to 2011 that were this uh, in, in absolutely needed impediment to, to reduce the flow of illegal immigration, a significant barrier by Chuck Schumer, he bragged about it, is now immoral and effective. In fact, the first bullet point of Biden's DHS appropriation plan, uh, he, he says no wall, no, 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 money, no money for the wall. So look, um, Clearly, border security and, and illegal immigration have become one of the most politically driven, emotionally charged, and ideologic-based uh, issues in recent history. I, I've, I've been serving this country in the bio for, for, for 35 years, under six different administrations, both Republican and Democrat. Um, and this does not bring me pleasure to say, but in those 35-plus years, six administrations, Republican and Democrat, I have never seen an administration so blatantly um, lie to the American people is this administration. Um, it, it, it almost, virtually everything with respect to border security and immigration coming out of this administration is a lie. It's absolutely not rooted in reality or the truth. And it's, it, it, look, right now they're, 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 they're changing, um, you know, how uh, our, they're, they're wanting to change, I think, what are our American values to fit neatly into their current narrative. Uh, as part of their strategy for permanent political power. Uh, they simply are making up their own reality. Uh, they're changing history. They're intentionally driving false narratives and forcing American people to, again, accept misleading binary choices. You either want to help poor immigrants with a better life or you're an uncompassionate, uncaring uh, uh, racist. That's the binary choice that they're trying to force American people, and they won't accept a, a rational discussion. The tax on the administration, have been relentless. We all saw it for the past four plus years. And the attacks continue uh, by the current Secretary of DHS, Ali Mayorkas, um, who continues to, I mean, it's, he's, he's almost defiant and arrogant uh, with, with some of the stuff he's saying. Like, for example, the lies that our borders are closed um, and our borders are secure. It, it, it's just absurd. And look, you, you don't have to be a, a, a border security expert to know this for what it is. It's a feeble attempt to, to tell American people we're not seeing what we're seeing with our own eyes. 190,000 in a single month? 270,000 gotaways? Uh, if, if you include the, 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 the apprehensions, the gotaways, and the turnbacks, those who, who go to the border and they're about to be apprehended and they go back to Mexico, I mean, already you're looking at 1.5 million people that have attempted illegally to enter our borders. But our borders are closed. Our borders are secure, right? It's, it, it, right. it's, it's absurd. But they're still peddling that. Um, and and they're, they're still hoping the American people are going to buy it. So rather than take full responsibility uh, for, for creating this crisis, the secretary continues to lie. Um, and especially, I think, what really gets me is he's lying to the very men and women on the front lines that he is now put in harm's way to, to address the unsecure, unmitigated disaster on the border that they, they uh, created. Another thing, look, I, I'm, I'm often asked, you know, am, uh, am I frustrated with what's happened on the southwest border? <laughs> well, clearly I am, um, right? Of course I am. You know, I, I've, I've had to watch with, with all of you, with the entire American people, as, as the Biden administration systematically dismantled 
every single effective tool and authority uh, that we put in place. You know, a network of policies and initiatives which regain integrity back in the system. It closed significant loopholes that were there. Uh, it, it applied a legitimate and reasonable consequences. It effectively reduced the flow of illegal aliens. It resulted in unprecedented cooperation with our foreign partners in Mexico and beyond in the Northern Triangle countries, and it provided the tools and resources to the men and women on the front lines to secure our borders. And this administration, with a stroke of a political pen, got rid of it all. And then what did they do? They blamed the Trump administration. We're not buying it. And that's another reason why I'm here and I'm going to continue to, to be heard. Because what they're peddling is absolute absurdity and, and it's, it's pure lies. Um, look, the, the truth is the Biden administration inherited the most secure borders in our history. That's a fact. Now, does it mean they were 100% secure? No, but they were the most secure that we've had, and they were getting more secure and more effective every single day because of Trump's policies, because of those network of tools, uh, uh, authorities, and policies. But look, my frustration doesn't just stem that they opened up all the loopholes, they returned catch and release, they've created the worst illegal immigration crisis on our southwest border, making our borders more vulnerable, less secure, and I've already gone on a, a lot about that. But but what is equally frustrating me, I think you're seeing the theme is, they, from day one, they're lying to you. Everything that they tell you about what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it is a lie. Look, I, I'll give you an example. So when they could no longer you know, keep the media at bay about the crowded, overcrowded border patrol facilities that we were seeing on the southwest border, it came to 2019, right? But the difference is we were trying to stop it and fix it, right? They're continuing to encourage it. Well, so they know that the political optics were bad. Border patrol facilities were overcrowded, right? So this is when the Biden administration came up with what I call their, their shell game, their Ponzi scheme, right? To give you an example, so in Donna, Texas, border patrol facilities were there, overcrowded, unaccompanied minors, right? Just in there, uh, dangerously crowded, it was bad, shouldn't be there, it's, it, it's bad all the way around. Well, what they did was they built a temporary HHS facility, right? Literally, like, I think it was 25, 40 yards away. I'm not making it up. Look it up. 25, 40 yards away at $800 million of your money to build the HHS facility. And then one day, to address political optics, not to address or, the, or stem the flow of illegal immigration, not to do a single thing to stop these people from giving them hard-earned money and their lives over the hands of cartels to be uh, smuggled. No, that's not why. It was to address political optics. They literally walked the unaccompanied minors, thousands of them, right, from the overcrowded border patrol facility, the 40 yards across the, the way into the HHS facility. And then they brought the cameras, where? to the border patrol facilities and said, look, nothing to see here, everything under control. Complete bullshit. I'm sorry. Right? Right? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so, actually, it's pretty good. I've only said one cuss word so far. So, um, they, they, and, and, and so when, when you look at that, so not only am I frustrated about actually physically uh, that our national security is being jeopardized, but also that they're lying about it. Um, another incredible false narrative they try to get the American people to believe is, I'm sure you heard it, but nothing to see here. Uh, this is about seasonal change, right? We always see this, you know, after the winter, the numbers go up, but then the summer, the numbers will go down. In fact, all the way up the chain, from Secretary Mayorkas to the press secretary to the President of the United States, all said this to us, right? And I laughed every single time I got out there and said, they're lying, just wait. And what do we see? June, 190,000. And oh, by the way, when they were saying that in April, we, at the time they were saying that, trying to shove that down the American people, we, we were experiencing a 900% increase from the same time last year. So why we're seeing a 900% increase, and by the way, it, the, the, the best seasonal change I think has been maybe 15% from month to month flows. And we were seeing a 900% increase and they're trying to jam that down. And then what do we see in June? 190,000 and there's no end in sight. So I, I don't believe any, any, any intellectually honest person believes that lie going forward as well. And then real quick, so 2019, how, how, how did we address the, 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 the crisis in 2019? Look, we, we, we saw, a, 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 you know, the, 
historically, immigration has been a problem for decades, but the last decade or so, there were several things that were happening. There, there was just nonsensical legislation, there was judicial activism uh, that, that was uh, happening, as, as well as what, what, what we think unconstitutional executive orders. And let me, let me talk to you, there, there's lots out there, but let me talk to you about a couple of the big ones. TVPRA, Tra Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. This is a piece of nonsensical legislation, legislation, half of it. Half of it made sense, the other didn't. It says that if you're from a contingent country and you're not identified as unaccompanied minors being trafficked, we're going to send you back to Mexico and Canada to be reunited with your family. Makes sense. Guess what? The other half of that law said if you're from outside of Mexico or Canada and you're not identified as being trafficked and you're an unaccompanied minor, we keep you. How does that make sense? I actually traveled to all three Northern Triangle countries. I spoke to leaders of all those countries, and every single one of them said to me unilaterally and separate, why are you keeping our kids? Why are you keeping the future of our country? Can you please change your laws that if they're not trafficked, can you return them to their families so they can come back home? It just doesn't make sense. DACA. I think everybody's familiar with DACA. Again, it's actually illegal and unconstitutional. It was created under Obama. They created a class that, that actually said if you fit into this category, we're going to defer and it's renewable your lawful deportation for being here illegally. Just recently, Fifth Circuit finally came out and said it's illegal, right? Finally. So you've got TVPRA and DACA, and then here comes the slammer. It's called FSA, the Floor Settlement Agreement. It's a, it's a lower level judicial court decree that at the end of the day, and there's a lot, of, there, there's been several uh, reinterpretations of it over the years, but at the end of the day, they said that if someone sneaks in, breaks into our border, is here illegally, and if you're an unaccompanied minor or a family, we cannot detain you for more than 20 days. And during those proceedings, we told the judge that we can't get through the lawful deportation proceedings in 20 days. Why? Because we're the most generous country in the face of the planet. And even though you broke into our country, violated our sovereign laws, violated the rule of law, we're still going to give you more due process than any country on the face of the planet. But it takes more than 20 days to do that. The judge says, I don't care. You got 20 days. Catch and release was born. That's what, that's what was born out of. And Congress failed, both Republicans and Democrats, have failed the American people to pass meaningful legislation to address TBPRA, DACA, or the Flores Settlement Agreement. And so that's why in 2019 we were faced with a crisis. But here's the key, though, right, is that I think one of the key things we did in 2019 is we were honest with you, right? We said we have a crisis. We were honest with American people. I gave more press briefings. I talked to more reporters. I opened up our facilities to anybody who wanted. We had more congressional oversight. We had more congressional delegations the time that I was there under the Trump administration than the history of DHS. Transparent, honesty, information was flowing, and we were honest that we actually had a crisis. And look, we did. We developed a, a, just a countless network of initiative policies and tools that really led to our successes. But let me, let me talk about um, just, just a couple, what, what I refer to as game changers. First, the Migrant Protection Protocol, the Remain in Mexico program. This was an absolute game changer. What, what it did was it took that floor settlement agreement that mandated that we release in 20 days, never to be heard from again. They would never show up. I don't care what anybody tells you, 90% of those people that say here illegally, they never complete their immigration hearings and they remain here illegally, 90%. Take that to the bank. I don't care what this administration tells you. So floor settlement grant had to release. The Migrant Protection Protocol said, okay, we have to address that loophole because that's the magnet. That's why they're coming. That's why you saw this huge shift, right, in families and unaccompanied minors from single adults we historically had seen. And so what we, what we saw was with the Remain in Mexico program is we said, nope, you're not coming in. You're not going to be released. You're going to wait in Mexico, go through your proceedings in the U.S., right? I know. Again, don't have to be a rocket scientist. What happened? Poof, the numbers go down. Why? Because we closed a loophole. No longer could you grab a kid and that was your passport in the United States. Because that's what it was before. That's what catch and release was. Grab a kid, come to our borders, break in, you're in free simply because you are so-called a family. MPP shut that down. It closed uh, that loophole. It closed catch and release. And by January 2020, I mean February 2020, you saw illegal immigration dip by 75%. 
MPP was absolutely a game changer. Now, there's a couple, one other policy that I want to talk about that adds to that, though. It's called the ACA, the Asylum Cooperative Agreements. This is what we entered to in the end with all three Central American countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And what the ACAs did was really bring the United States up to the, with the international standards. And I know, again, this is common sense, right? If, if you're actually fleeing persecution, which here's another thing too. So there's a, a big false narrative out there. The asylum law is very clear. You have to be the victim of state-sponsored persecution for being the member, either based on your nationality, your ethnicity, your, your political affiliation, or member of a protected class. Your economic status does not qualify you for asylum. Now look, I get it. You could be uh, living in harsh conditions, uh, conditions none of us would want to uh, live in. I got it. But that's not a valid asylum claim. But that's a false narrative that they're trying to get the American people to believe, right? So the ACA said, look, for those of you that have a valid claim, rather than give $7,000 of your life savings to the cartels and risk your life, we know independent studies show up to 30% of women and children are abused. Border Patrol, it's not uncommon for Border Patrol to interview somebody that has been raped more than once on the journey here, and I could keep going on and on. Rather than do that, right, why don't you, why don't we mandate that those with legitimate claims actually seek relief in the first country they come to? Makes sense, right? And what that stopped was what we referred to as forum shopping, right? And the ultimate, they wanted to get to the United States. So they were putting, those with, obviously those with, with, with uh, um, fake claims, obviously they just wouldn't get in America. But I'm talking about the ones that had valid claim. They were actually putting their goal, their form shopping, to get to the U.S. actually ahead of their public health and safety, right? By waiting and, and, and going to the cartels and being smuggled in the United States instead of getting relief in the first country you come to. Uh, that was also a game changer. Again, that read, led to that significant reduction. The other thing too, and I know most of you have probably heard, is Title 42, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. Title 42, while you know the whole world is going through a global pandemic, and we still are, a new variant, not as deadly, but it's, it's still contagious, that's going there, so we're not still over the other side of that, um, that said the CDC, after consultation with the border security experts, said, well, you know what, this is a problem. So as an, as an effective containment and mitigation strategy to further reduce the introduction of COVID-19 into our country from outside our borders, the CDC mandated that Border Patrol no longer allow people that break into the country that have traveled through COVID hotspots, have, have remained in overcrowded, unsanitary stash houses and tractor trailers for days and weeks. We have no, no PPE. We have no idea what their medical history is. Doesn't it just make sense as we're dealing with the COVID in this country? that we say we're not gonna let those people that have illegally entered into our open air congregate settings. It's gonna expose migrants, our personnel, and the American people to COVID. So they said, you apprehend them, process them on the border, remove them immediately. And so that's what we did. In my opinion, that has saved countless American lives. And what did this administration do? Unaccompanied minor? Boop, nope, doesn't apply anymore. 100,000, 100,000. 100,000 unaccompanied minors now. They got rid of Title 42 on day one for the unaccompanied minors, and we have experienced a 444% increase in unaccompanied minors. April, we saw almost 19,000. That's the highest number of unaccompanied minors uh, in a single month in history on the record books. And the last time I checked, I'm not a medical doctor, don't want to play one on TV, but you know, unaccompanied minors can carry COVID uh, just as well as an adult can. The other part to that is they're actively been talking about getting rid of Title 42 for everybody, but really in, 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 in essence, when it comes to families, they're already not applying it. Even though it still applies to families, 80% of families are still being, the illegal entry are still being released in the United States. Um, and I, I think so, well, Title 42 is just one example, I think I'll, I'll bring it back to where I started, is another example of, of how the correlation between illegal immigration and the necessity to have uh, uh, give the United States the tools and the capability to secure our borders against all threats, including infectious diseases. And the last thing that, that I'll mention, um, and, and then I'll, I'll shut up here, is I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't have a conversation without talking about the wall, right? So let's talk about the wall, for example, right? So let's go back to 2006 Secure Fence Act. Remember? Remember all those prominent Democratic senators that said, oh, yeah, we need a wall. It's important. 650 miles of wall was built. Again, we just built a better, 
It was so needed. Stop illegal immigration. Stop the drugs from pouring in to secure our borders. This is absolutely needed. We voted for it, bragged about it, and now it's immoral and ineffective now. All of a sudden, because President Trump is in, 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 uh, in the White House and we're building a wall better than ever before. Look, the wall, hands down, again, the, the, the strategy that's codified in the 2000 Secure uh, Fence Act that's been tried and true for decades, infrastructure, technology, and personnel, wherever that multi-phase uh, multi strategy is in place in strategic location, every single imaginable success measure increases. Every single measure increases. When you have the right uh, um, um, uh, layer of, of each one of those elements, the, the, look, at the end of the day, the wall is an effective impedance denial tool, and that's a fact. There's historical data, there's analysis that shows that. We presented it again and again and again and again, and this administration has ignored it. Just, the, just the, uh, I think it was uh, yesterday, uh, Senator Lankford uh, uh, published a report on the wall that said right now this administration, which by the way, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I called it, I, I, I said this from day one, that by stopping building the wall was actually going to cost the taxpayers billions of dollars to stop building the wall. The report came out and said so far th uh, uh, this fiscal year by Biden stopping the walls cost you taxpayers $2 billion and it continues to cost you $3 million a day. Not my words, that's an official report. So, and we knew it, we called it, everybody absolutely ignored it. Um, and the, one of the last thing I'll say about the wall, I have to say this because, you know, early on I would get this and they're like, ah, it's a 14th century solution to a 21st century problem, right? I said, yeah, so is the wheel, but that still works pretty well, right? So uh, it, it's just sometimes the, the arguments are, are, are just ludicrous. So look, I'll, I'll close with this, is that unfortunately illegal immigration clearly has become a, a political uh, a weapon, in my opinion, uh, by the left, one that often relies on children and the vulnerable pop population. That, that this administration is exploiting to further what they see as a perceived political benefit. It's being weaponized uh, at the expense of American sovereignty, security, our future, our well-being, America's national economic security. It, it absolutely, just, I can't believe that I, I even say this these days, but it shouldn't be traded for political power. But that, this is exactly where we find ourselves. And I think the lesson to be learned here for all of us is um, uh, don't become complacent get involved. And so people, when, when I look at, at, at everything that the Biden administration done on the federal level, like what can we do? Yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that because every single day they double down. Every single week, I think I wake up Monday and think, okay, I'm going to have a week to catch up. The Biden administration does something else to screw it up, right? Uh, across the board to just make it even more dangerous, jeopardize our national security even more. And so w one thing that I've been saying is what I mean by we can get involved is so everybody talks about 2022, right? Yes, 22 matters, I got it. But we can't wait till then. That's too late. It's too late. I mean, this year, we are actually, we, I, I think we're going to be, we're going to set historic highs for, for numbers coming across illegal, illegally. And again, it's not about illegal immigration. It's about border security. They're all interconnected, right? So here's what I'm trying to say is, is uh, we were talking a little bit about this before, but everything from, from school board elections to mayors, right? It all matters. It all matters. Um, I mean, look at the defund the police stuff. I'll stop. I don't want to get too off. Uh, you know, I, I go off on tangent on that. But, but look, but get to your state legislators, right? Get to your state's AGs. Get to your state's governors. It's working. Look, Governor Abbott uh, in Texas is leading the way. AG Paxson is leading the way. Within, the, within days after the Biden administration taken over and he tried to stop deportations for 100 days, an absolutely illegal executive order, absolutely illegal on its face, AG Paxson is the only one that sued and he won and he got a nationwide injunction to stop that, right? So we need more of that. We've got other states like, uh, so, so Texas right now, he's, he's stepping up. He, he's going to build the wall, and I, I will help him any imaginable way that I can to continue to build that wall. But he's doing more. He declared a state of emergency, right? And so now he's able to take lower-level misdemeanors and raise those up to higher-grade misdemeanors to actually give real consequences to those that are breaking our, 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 our laws and, and, and taking advantage of the loopholes in our system. He's actually going to apply consequences. You've got Governor DeSantis now that's actually stepped up and says he's going to give resources um, um, to Texas. And, and I'll end with this. You know, there, there was a reporter. I watched the Governor DeSantis, uh, his, his um, interview, and it's ill-informed, 
um, he just didn't always talk about reporters, said, well, why are you going to send Floridian resources to Texas for, for a problem in Texas, right? And he did a great job. And he said, well, first of all, uh, states help other states all the time when they're not infected to include Florida, a little thing called hurricanes, right? And states send resources to Florida all the time. But he said, that's not what we're talking about here. And he really did a great job of talking about how every, what I say, town, city, and state is a border town, city, and state. What happens on the southwest border doesn't stay there. It makes its way to every neighborhood in this country. And he gave a really good example, one of many, that said 90% of the meth that comes into Florida comes from the southwest border. Right. And I always say, if you have a meth overdose in your city, in your town, in your state, I guarantee you it came from the southwest border. So with that, I'm going to shut up and uh, probably talk. No, I'm, I'm not mad, huh? Yeah. OK. All right. So um, I tell you what, this was hard to actually keep with this short, um, believe it or not, um, because there's so much out there so complex. But like I said, I I'd really like to, to hear questions. So is this just a modern result of the 1965 Kennedy-Johnson law? I'm not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm old. I'm not that old yet. Well, you know, the immigration laws were changed in 1965 yeah. for Kennedy to, for the, the family to for the results. And then yep. this has just grown and grown and grown for 55 years. Yeah, okay. So now, yeah, so yes. And that, that's a very good point. And this is another, you know, absolute false narrative that's out there is that root causes. I'm so tired of hearing root causes, right? Here's what the root causes are. When we open our borders, they come, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the root causes. Look, if you look at the difference between, again, let's take April because that's the highest difference. So April this year, April last year, 900% increase. 900% increase in illegal immigration in this country. What didn't change during that time period? The economic conditions in the, uh, Central America. They didn't change. COVID. COVID was there. They were still experienced COVID like everybody else. Nothing changed in that year. But how in the world did we get to a 900% increase? It's because our policies changed. So you're spot on. Every single time that there's a shift in our policies at our border, they are exploited, and history points that out. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to wait for the microphone. Um, um, I, I'm, um, do you think that, uh, isn't it, uh, isn't there this uh, migration issue prima facie evidence that the heterosexuals of this world are creating more life than those heterosexuals uh, or this world or, or you and this organization or this country are willing to accommodate? So um, do, uh, is it worthwhile to consider any opposition you, if you're concerned about border security and migration to uh, 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 reconsider any opposition you might have to um, uh, uh, birth control, feminism, choice on abortion, um, queer acceptance, uh, and so on, especially noting a lot of these pro-migrants come from countries yeah. dominated by conservative Christianity so, having the most draconian anti-abortion laws on So what I would say, that's way outside my bandwidth or expertise. Yeah. I'm just a knuckle-dragger operator, and I know about border security, illegal immigration. That, I can tell you, is screwed up. So, yep. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst. Um, Obviously, what the real driver here is that uh, <coughs> Democrats are, are counting on uh, that a generation hence. These people are overwhelmingly going to vote Democratic, in part to replace all the Democrats lost to abortion, no doubt. Um, my concern is that there's zero chance that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Iranian Pazdaran are not seeing this with very clear spectacles on and planning accordingly so that amongst the 2,000 or so uh, Middle Easterners that we've interdicted already, um, there is bound to be a plot in the works. And so my question is, does all of this nonsense end after the next terror spectacular? 
Yeah, so I, I tell you, I'm so glad you asked this question because I actually took that out of my comments because I, I was there's so much to talk about. So I'm glad you asked it in a question. So I, I couldn't agree more with you. Look, and that's why I keep saying when you open your border up to one crisis, one threat, you're open your border up to every crisis that we see, the very vast, complex set of threats. And I agree with you. If you don't think that the terrorist organizations who are just like the cartels, right, who are looking for every single opportunity to exploit, to do us harm. They have not wavered in that resolve. We have hardened our defenses among multiple ways for them to get to this country and do us harm, but they've changed their TTPs as well as you know. And so to think that they're not looking at our porous, unsecure Southwest border in a way that they could utilize and exploit to do us harm, I think is naive and absolutely does not take in consideration the facts and the history. So I, I, I think that's a real threat and I'm absolutely concerned about that. Look, the Border Patrol apprehends uh, uh, on, on average uh, people from 140 different countries. So what we progress with was mainly Mexico, single adults, and now with uh, everything that I described, it shifted to uh, families, unaccompanied uh, minors, mainly from the Northern Triangle countries, but it's expanded now. And now this administration, and, and look, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go to my grave, it's not backing off from this. They've opened up our borders and sent a clear message, not just to the Western Hemisphere, but to the entire world that our borders are open. So to think that we're, our national security is not in jeopardy here is a mistake. In fact, that's the, genesis, you know, that's the genesis of the 2006 Secure Fence Act, right? In the Secure Fence Act, it talks about securing our borders against terrorists or the introduction of terrorist weapons into the, uh, in the United States via our borders. That's the very premise of, of the 2006 Secure Fence Act, and now it's not talked about at all like it doesn't exist. Ion Hearsay Ali just released a book called Prey. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but she talks about the, the difficulties that the European countries are facing because the women in many of the large cities are now unable to walk safely by themselves as Western women who have been used to that kind of freedom. And the gentleman over there responded with the second half of my question, which is, um, you know, the safety of our communities now, where does it lie? I mean, you're talking about closing borders. I'm talking about my niece in the second cornfield on the left in Indiana has a huge contingent of people being shoved into her community, and she's trying to do the best she can to help educate them, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that I suspect we are going to need a lot of help from law enforcement agencies to maintain the kind of order when you have this mix of a lot of unaccompanied males who are criminals, uh, who are going to be basically making us prey. So how do we instigate our own self-defense other than each of us having a shotgun in our house? For, for, first, first of all, by, by the way, I, I am an advocate of weapon ownership, so I, I have just a few. Um, but but here, here, here's what I'll say is, is we have to continue to do stuff like this. And I know it's a little sappy and corny, I'm saying this, I'm standing up here, but I believe this because this is about education and awareness. Look, the mainstream media is an extension of the Democratic Party. I talk to people all the time, they are misinformed, not because they're ignorant, but because of the mainstream media is feeding them lies and misinformation and spin. And the reality, what you just said is absolutely correct. Let me give you an example to bring it home, sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities are the worst thing for our public safety that we have. And let me give you an example. Right now, under this administration, because of their priorities, and they basically shut down ICE, the Sheriff's Department can arrest a known gang member, a known gang member that's here illegally, has had multiple entries, and was just arrested for a nonviolent felony, say they robbed your home, burglary of a home. They're gonna arrest them, they're gonna call ICE and say, we got one for you, guess what ICE is gonna say? Nope, not a priority. Go ahead and release them back to your community. That's what we have now. So it's not just that the federal authorities' hands are being tied, but the local law enforcement hands are being tied. There's a 287G program where local sheriff's office can actually work with ICE to efficiently remove people that are here illegally with the priority being criminals as it's always been. We have multiple uh, sheriffs out there now, Democratic sheriffs, that are getting rid of the 287G program. That the actual nominee for ICE, this is why we need to, we need to absolutely resist any single nomination that DHS is putting forward right now. The ICE nomination is a sheriff. He actually ended the 287G program in his county. So it, it's an issue all the way across. And, and, and there, one, I'm sorry, one, one quick thing. So angel families, 
Have you guys heard of angel families? So angel families are American citizens that have had a loved one die at the hands of an illegal alien. How many times, how often did you hear from an angel family? I remember in 2019, I was standing on the south side of the Capitol with a bunch of angel families while uh, with some Republican leadership while the Democrats were on the north side holding up pictures of federal agents that hadn't gone without a check in two weeks. That shows you where we're at. I'm not saying that's great either, but holy cow, really? When, when, is the last time, when was the last time this president, this president, our DHS Secretary Mayorkas, went and actually spoke to an angel family who lost a loved one at the hands of an illegal um, uh, immigrant, illegal alien in a sanctuary city that was released that should have been deported. How many times did that happened? Zero. Sorry, I get fired up. And this will be our last question. Thank you. Um, from the time of the inauguration of Biden, it took him a long time to react to the border. Then it took him a long time to assign Kamala Harris to take care of the problem. Then it took a long time for her to decide whether or not she's going to go to the border. And when she did get on a plane, she didn't go to the border. That's right. And then she came back. Here's my question. How do you see her playing out this role of solving the border crisis as the numbers continue to rise? She's going to try to avoid it at all costs and address political optics only, and not a single substantive issue or action will come from her mouth. That's what's going to happen, because that's what she's already doing. Uh, uh, when, when you've anointed the vice president as the czar, then that's the person that's in charge now. Uh, we have the same thing in a positive way under the Trump administration with COVID. The Vice President Pence was anointed the, the, the chair, if, if you will, uh, for the COVID task force. And so even the HS secretary then would report, that's how it should go. But it, it's a joke. We know it's all substance over form. You know, look, we know the only reason why she went there, the only reason why she went there is because President Trump went, right? I mean, she had no plans to go, and then President Trump said he's going to go, and all of a sudden she went three days before he did, right? And by the way, I went with President Trump to the border, and w uh, here, here was a unique difference. We, we First, we actually went to the border, right? We actually, got, we actually went outside of the air-conditioned space, right? We actually went to the epicenter of the crisis. Now, don't get me wrong. All 2,000 miles are busy. All, you got 190,000 a single month. All nine sectors on the southwest border are busy. But if you really understand the truth and reality of any crisis, you go to the epicenter. You know, George, when, 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 when President Biden went to see the, the condo that collapsed, he didn't go three blocks away, right? You go to see the actual crisis to understand it. President Trump and Governor Abbott actually went to the epicenter, the Rio Grande Valley, where the majority of, of illegal entries in the crisis is happening. And he actually went outside of air-conditioned space and actually went to the border and actually went to the wall. Um, and, and so, look, at, at, at the end of the day, um, I, I, I think they're the same. But the D DHS Secretary Mayorkas, he's lying to you. He is lying. And he, remember, he was the Deputy Secretary uh, um, uh, under Obama. And, and it was then that Secretary Jay Johnson, remember his quote? He said, and I was the Chief of the Border Patrol then, right? So I was the Chief of the Border Patrol in the Obama administration working for Jay Johnson, you know, reporting to then Deputy Secretary Mayorkas, when Jay Johnson said, a thousand illegal immigrants a day is a bad day, a thousand. We're getting six to 7,000 a day, right? And they haven't done a single thing to address the flow. All they're doing is expanding and facilitating and playing a shell game. Not, not only, I, I give you a quick story about how they move migrants from one facility to the next, they're flying families and unaccompanied minors in the middle of the night to cities all throughout the United States, right? Why? Because they're trying to hide what's physically happening on the border. They're just getting better at releasing. They're not, and, and so it, it's, it, it's an absolute shell game. And so they're, they're not doing anything to stem the flow. They're just getting better at facilitating and releasing people. I'll give you another quick story. ADT, sorry. Uh, so alternative to detention. So you come here, you break into our country, here legally, we give you an ankle bracelet. Just like we do any other criminal in the United States that we don't put behind bars, right? Because it's supposed to inspire you to show up, right? Because um, you're wearing that bracelet. If not, then we know we are going to get you. 
This administration now, which was fully supportive of that, fully supportive of that, because they didn't want anybody to be detained. So they really loved ADT. And now they're saying, well, those bracelets are demeaning. What we'd like to do is to get rid of that and let's give them a cell phone. I'm, I'm not making it up. I'm not making it up. That's what's happening. So when you ask me what Vice President Harris is gonna do, nothing but make the problem worse. In fact, early on, I was one, a little bit tongue in cheek, but I was serious. I was like, I hope she doesn't go to the border because there's not gonna be anything substance. She's just gonna make it worse. And, and this current DHS secretary, he's the same thing. He's, he, he's absolutely, I mean, remember, he was one of the, the authors of DACA. He is a full open border uh, a secretary. He's lying to you about the border secure and open and could go on and on. This administration is not gonna do anything to secure this border. They're just gonna hide it from you, gonna come up with policies, continue to do it because Look, two things for me, they see a perceived political benefit in two ways. One is they're playing the long game. So they see a potential increase in house seats in the census. Why? Because now illegal aliens are counted in the census. So that's a very real threat. And then the other part of that, they see that every individual that they find illegal alien, that they find a pathway to citizenship, they believe that's gonna to equate to a democratic vote. That's where we're at. And one, one, one last thing, I know, I'll shut up, is, is that, so the, the, there's a dirty little secret about amnesty, right? Guess who, guess who is the only folks that care about amnesty? Democrats. Democrats. Because again, they think that a pathway to citizenship is going to equate to a democratic vote. Guess who doesn't care about amnesty? Illegal aliens today. They do not care. If you ask an illegal alien, because we do, if we allowed you to illegally enter the country and stay, work illegally and not be deported, but you can never be a citizen or vote, guess what they say? I'm in. And guess what? That's what we're doing right now, right? They don't, amnesty, being a citizen or vote, that, that, that doesn't even break their top 10 right now, right? They're economic migrants. They just want to come here and have a better life. They want to have a better car, better house. Uh, God bless them, but they need to follow the law. Yep.